So you and your friends have been reading about new game systems to try on Friday, Saturday nights after being thrown out one too many bars. After exploring a bit, you've heard quite a bit about this brand new Exalted system people are raving about. Perhaps you heard the game was epic where you play as flawed god kings to prepare a broken and shattered world. Or maybe you just read the memes about heroin pissing dinosaurs and T-Rexes and F-14 fighter jets. You've listened to podcasts talking about awesome gameplay moments and the fluff in the game, so you figure, what the hell, let's give it a shot. Out of all the people in the group, you're the one chosen to be the storyteller or game master, the person who runs the game. How hard can this be, right? You poor bastard. If you own Exalted 3rd Edition, you're going to notice it has no chapter on how to run a game. In fact, there's no book for it at all. There's no monster manual yet, and while the book has several basic antagonists for you and your players, they might get sick of fighting that Octavian demon after six or so time. The game describes how subsystems work, but there's no advice on how to make or run subsystems in the game. There's no advice or guidelines. You're left to run the game, run the game Dark Souls style, where you keep failing to succeed. There's all these people gushing about how Exalted is great, but when it comes down to running it, they just kind of shrug. Eh, maybe not. I've kind of left my head under a rock. By the time many new storytellers begin to grasp the system, both them and their players are frustrated enough to just play another game altogether. You need one of those no-lifers who essentially live and breathe the game to tell you all about it. Thankfully, I'm one of those no-lifers. This video is seriously going in depth about how to run a game in Exalted 3rd Edition. I'll not be focusing on lore except where absolutely necessary, as quite frankly, things that discuss lore are far more common. Rather, I'll be focusing on how a new storyteller can run the game for his or her friends to help you navigate through some of the pitfalls and design challenges that may exist. A lot of this information could be applied to RPG systems in general, but I'll mainly be talking through the lens of Resolved. I mean, it would be nice if I could play another game world and not have my game explode within the first several sessions, but hey, I keep dreaming. Maybe when I get the Infinity a bit better, I'll make that Mass Effect Psionic subsystem assuming no one else has. In fact, I already wrote a Storyteller's Guide for Exalted 3rd Edition, which gives you some information on how to run a game. This video series will be exploring the concepts a bit more in depth, but if you want the reading material, you can check it out the links in the video description below. This video series is going to be large on me talking as well. I'll throw some things on the screen every now and again, but it isn't an overly necessary to look at it. Otherwise, just enjoy the footage and enter the gungeon. I got a pretty good run this time. I'm going to make a few assumptions ahead of time. I'm going to assume that you and your friends have already found a good time slot to play in, and a good location to play in as well. If you're having issues finding a location, you can usually cheaply get rooms at local libraries, or you can play from comfort of your own home using websites as Roll20. If you're a university student, you can even see if there are spare classrooms you can play in, assuming the university will allow you to. Otherwise, I'm going to be jumping directly into the meat of this video right away. Where are you running your game of Exalted? What kind of game tone do you want? How to treat the world's living thing? And player agency. So without further ado, let's get into this. Part 1. Location. After you and your friends hammer out time and place to run the game, the beginning hurdles of a new game start to crop up. Where in the game world do I run the game? What kind of game do I want to run? How can I keep any sort of plot cohesive with players so powerful? I read a bit in the game world and holy crackers, there's a lot of moving parts. How do I keep the game world believable? Who the hell's gonna bring our snacks? These are questions we're going to need answering before we even touch the mechanics of the game. And oh boy, you better believe that's coming someday. So this video will be all about the pregame, how to get set up and start answering these questions. So if people stumbling across this video are looking for other game systems to play, why would you want to play Exalted? I feel this is better explained in depth in many other podcasts and essays online, but I'll give you the short version. In other game systems, you might work nearly the entire game to come forward to become a demigod, at or near the end of the game. Exalta starts you at that point from the get-go. You're not just powerful in combat, but nearly every field of human capability and beyond. Superhuman traders can work hand-in-hand -hand with army slaying swordsmen, and whenever a swordsman cannot be, the trader can either bribe or convince them to join. You can fight a big scary demon, sure, but how about getting that demon on your payroll? Subsystems such as craft and social are not just bolted on and go beyond just roll over a certain number and do something. This gives a very rewarding experience when you become superhuman in a field. The game isn't a pure power fantasy either, as there are many things in the universe capable of opposing your players in the setting, such as the Realm or Hoslanti League, the reality manipulating powers of the Fair Folk, or just pissing up heaven and hell and having to deal with their ages trying to take pieces of your pie or head. The setting is very rich, as a lot of moving parts to work with. In fact, it's one of the main reasons Exalted has been going all these years, despite dying nearly multiple times. However, I'm going to be honest and not sugarcoat this for you. Exalted is a complex mechanical system. Sure, you don't have anything like Q, Brutes for HP formulas. In fact, the basic system is pretty simple, but it has a lot of moving parts. I still say give it a shot, 
Try anything at least once. But if your group finds anything more complex than Fate Core or Chubo hard to run, Exalted may give you a hard time. In this case, alternative Exalted systems exist, and while they may not be my personal cup of tea, they work pretty well for others. Out of the systems I played, Quixalted is a reductionist version that uses the same basic dice pool mechanic, but allows them to make up powers on the fly. Mutants and Masterminds might seem like an odd fit, but it does work out pretty well in play once you get past the character creation. Fate Core works out pretty well, in fact it's probably my personal favorite out of the lot. The Fate System Toolkit has a section in it called the Six Visors, which is essentially Exalted Charms. If you want to mix it with more ideas such as Mega Stunts from Atomic Rubble, you'll be set. Plus the Game Master advice in Fate Core is amazing. I highly recommend reading it, regardless of your gaming system. System replacements to Exalted I have not personally experienced are the Cortex Command Hack, Exalted Blood and Fire, Godbound, and Burning Wheel. I cannot comment on these too much as I haven't played them, but they're options. Godbound is particularly noteworthy as it's based on the D20 chassis, so if you want a gateway Dragon Exalted while your group is still heavily familiar in Dungeons and Dragons or the D20 system, it's a pretty solid choice. So now that you've decided to play Exalted 3rd Edition, or at least from the game world, the question now remains where you want to play. Creation, the world where Exalted takes place in, is huge. But if the game talks about direction, it means whenever your game will take place in the north, south, east, west, or central locations. You can play Exalted as a globetrotting game, but each area of Exalted can typically give you enough material that you can play very comfortably in just one direction alone. When looking at long-term games, conquering an entire direction is an extremely impressive feat in and of itself. As I said, each direction is fairly fleshed out over the course of two editions, so you have no shortage of locations you can borrow from the previous editions or just cramp off from the various homebrew sites. But what about the summary of each direction? Here's the thing, you can spend literally an entire series of videos just by talking about the stuff in one specific direction. This isn't the purpose of the series. I'm only going in-depth as much as needed in order to explain how to run the game. The third edition book explains areas of Exalted very well, so if you're running the game, I highly recommend reading Chapter 2 and the players, at the very minimum, reading the direction they'll be running in in order to get a better idea of the world. But I'll briefly summarize each of the directions for you. The North! Nordic Viking territory with a harsh wilderness beckoning to be explored. Think Skyrim if you need a quick example, but it has airships in Civil War too. Also, Ta Todd Howard isn't constantly trying to make you buy the game several t dozen times in a row. The West. Adventures in the high seas of pirates abound. Stop by the coastal islands to say hello to enslave the locals, or to say hello to them. It also has pirates. Everywhere. South. Arabian Nights, desert area exalted. Filled with riches and dangers in all corners and directions. There's also sand, so get used to it. Scavenger Lands. This is a bit unique. It takes place in the east of Exalted, but when they say the Scavenger Lands, they mean basically between the first part of the east and the deep part of the east. The Scavenger Lands is a war-torn area creation filled with strife and riches, akin to the warring nations of Sengoku, Japan. This is great for enter enterprising warlords, and honestly, more than half of all Exalted games come from here, because it's the most populated region of Exalted. The Far East. Further east of Scavenger Lands lies the endless forest of the East, where the great nation of Halta spends its days fighting off Lone Owen nations, diplomatic tensions of the Fey and Draugr's forces all at the same time. Also, I really hope you like trees, because there's no shortage of them. They're everywhere. Blessed Isle. Home of the realm and a favorite for high entry games. High stakes games of cat and mouse for all skill levels here, but the payoff is worth it, as if one controls the realm, they control the creation. And if the Emperor is missing, the throne is up for grabs. If you're playing Solars, this can be a very difficult place to start in. It's basically, I want to be the guy in Exalted Edition, so just be prepared for that. Part 2. Game Tone. Okay, so now you and your friends have decided what kind of direction you want to play in. Great, but what if you're brand new to running pen and paper RPGs? First is, God help you. Second is determining some other factors of the game, such as how long you want to run it, taboo subjects, and the tone of the game. First, length. How long do you plan to run your game? A single session? A single adventure? A year? Multi-year? Or just whenever? Try to be clear with your players and ask them how long they wish the game to be, or how long you want to run it. I find this useful, as players know how long the game will last, and there won't be a taste of bitterness if the game suddenly comes to an end. Especially if you have an end date. I find that's a usual met metric for planning, so the game can end on a high note. 
Next is taboo subjects. If there's anything at your table that might make people squeamish and ruin their enjoyment of the game, as I said, Exalt is a big setting with a lot of material for it, and being a white wolf system means they're going to include such things. Slavery, torture, and even rape are dealt with within the game. I mean, one of the basic examples of this is the spousal abuse the Solar Dezus inflicted on his wife Lilith. She was just trying to help him, and he beat her to the point of miscarriage. Yeah. Compared to some of the other things this game has published, this is on the kind of a light side of things. So unless you know your group really well, go ahead and discuss what kind of things you do or do not want to be in your game. If you don't want to include the darker themes in your game, then handle them off screen or just don't include them. I've run many successful games without ever even touching on themes such as slavery, rape, or torture, or are things that make people feel icky. But what other concepts? Would players be interested in something like a love story, or are they not comfortable with such things at the table? Discuss these things ahead of time so everyone is on the same page. It takes less than a minute and it saves a lot of potential drama down the road. If you want to make a clearer understanding even faster, use the movie restriction ratings. Saying you want a PG or R-rated game gets things clear up a lot faster than explaining every detail. Now we arrive at the tone of the game. Tone is what I call the overall general feeling of the game itself. Exulting and vary in tone from a gritty tale of a tragic hero or a just go full blown anime. This is baked in the DNA of Exalted since the very beginning. Those who say otherwise probably don't remember Grabowski, one of the original creators of Exalted, often referenced things such as those are hunt elves and magical knight ray earth. So break this down for your group. Are you looking for something lighthearted or fun? A game where you can deeply invest in your character? Or maybe something in between? This is pretty important when trying to plan out things for the future and, again, Spending several minutes at the beginning discussing such things with your players nips many potential problem buds that may appear in the future. So we've accomplished what sounds like little tiny insignificant details that don't matter. But you gotta remember, these little tiny details are seeds that will eventually grow in a great game of all, rather than just having a mound of dirt that no one enjoys. So now that we got that all out of the way, we conduct some research into the setting, learn a bit about it, and try to plan our story out. But as you read deeper in the setting and go down that rabbit hole, you find out that, oh boy, oh boy, are there ever a lot of interconnected items in place. Your players want to make their own kingdom? What about the rival nations? What's this place called the realm that wants to kill your players just for existing? Why are these Sidreals coming down from heaven who also hate you and are making curses on you? What about if the divine courts are in the area? What are the rocks are here? Who are these werewolf results, and why do they want to tear down my kingdom, and why do they suddenly turn into a group of snakes? If you're new to running games, feel free to take a shot of your strongest liquor right now. Even experienced game masters have problems with this, so you're not alone. Part 3. Living World The Exalted setting is something I would best describe as heavily leaning into a living world model. Your characters are supposed to be the big damn heroes, and your actions have consequences. Things that will be felt throughout the region, possibly the world. For example, if you cause a massive defeat of a rival kingdom's army, it just doesn't mean that you'll be facing a small force. It means all the consequences of having to deal with lost troops in the kingdom. Famines could spread from lack of able-bodied men and women to make food. Crime and banditry can go up on the rise as there's no longer enough troops to protect the road. Or maybe a kingdom of their own rivals could decide that now's the best time to attack. This is before we're getting into stuff like Heaven, Hell, Gods, The Wild, or numerous other parties that might be involved in the situation as well. So how the hell are we going to keep such a thing cohesive? How are we going to keep track of all this at once? Let's start with the simplest and easiest method. They're behind the curtain. What do you mean by this? I mean that such organizations are still there, they still exist, but for the moment, they're not interacting with the same game pieces your players are currently interacting with. Such things can easily be hand-waved away as dealing with other issues at the current moment, or just not being plain interested in what's going on yet. If it was your first time, start the game with a smaller amount of actors. Focus just maybe on what your players are interested in, and maybe any initial plot hooks at, once you have to start. Once you get more used to the system and setting, you can pull back the curtains to reveal these new actors. Don't worry about starting too small or too big. Doing something like conquering a kingdom as your first adventure is easily within most starting Exalted game metrics. Depending on the tone, it might make be a single adventure, or it might be multiple adventures, depending on how in-depth you want it to be, but still, a perfectly valid starting adventure. So now we're past the bloat overlord, but we need to keep track of these things. Is there anything special or different you want to make in the current area? What about non-playable characters? What are the motivations? 
any cults, trading groups, or political factions you want to make and keep store of. Managing in-game information is a technique that varies game master to game master or storyteller to storyteller. Personally, I use Google Documents to break down information by location, factions, NPCs, and other areas that contain their notes and personal stats. Story on the Cloud usually helps me, just in case my hard drive dies out, which sadly happened more than once. Some other people might make a small wiki for their game world, which is useful as any information you don't want the players to see you can restrict access, and your players can help chip in pre seeing together information in the game world. If you don't want to use a laptop, then the good idea would be to purchase a pack of 3x5 cards and put some basic notes on them and print a stat sheet for some of the more detailed antagonists you have down the line. But in procession notes, it's probably the best thing in lieu of an actual laptop. So how do we flesh out the material of these people, places, and things? If it's something official, how does it differ from the official material for your specific game? The best way to start off with this, the rule of three from Lazy Dungeon Master. Running down three things on that location you want to emphasize or are different. For NPCs, think of three traits about them, be it any relevant intimacies, goals, or motivations, or the personality they may have. Now, keep those things on the cards, and when it's time to add more personal information, just throw it on a card. I find this is a good rule to follow, as making three things isn't exactly too hard, while at the same time, you're never, not going to make an NPC full of stuff they will never going to be using. This set of three can also be expanded. New locale, three points of interest inside of it, with three people inside of it. Making a battle need to set a scene, three points of interest or features in it that could benefit or hinder people. Making a new real-time strategy game, three factions. Making a new competitive sh shooter, three features per character. Ordering your pizza, three topics. See the connection yet? These are the old basic points of making NPCs, however. There is far more in-depth knowledge that can be covered in another video. The same thing goes on trying to make a story for your players. But you know the big difference between traditional media and tabletop games? Freedom of choice. Part 4. Freedom of choice and consequences. Freedom of choice in games means players are free to take whatever actions they want to take. If you want to weave a story, then you're going to have to be very careful. They say in the military that rule number one is no plan survives contact with the enemy. Most stories or ideas you're going to have in pen and paper RPGs are going to be the same thing. Players will always take unexpected actions that will throw you for a loop. I want to explore this concept in greater detail when I go over how to make a story for Exalted, but I feel that I have to include this now given a bit how Exalted works. After all, in this game, if you try to have a king give your players a quest, they can very likely use their abilities to get the king to give him his crown and land very easily. This is a very vicious derailing to most people. So how is something like this handled? The players have so much power? The answer? Roll with it. As I said before, Exalted is mainly, in my opinion, a game that deals with consequences. That is, the fall of your own actions, good or bad. So a player can use hypnotic tongue technique to force the king to hand over his crown, or train a group of farmers and elite fighters, each with the strength of 10 men in combat, or just sleep with the king to make him irresistibly fall in love with you. For starting characters, it isn't a question of can you take over the kingdom, but more of how do you want to do it. Let's break some of these examples down piece by piece. So, option A. Use mind control to force the king to hand over his crown and make him swear an oath by heaven that the kingdom is indeed yours. There's no way around it, the king basically gave over his land to you. But does that mean the king's men are going to accept this? What about the nobles in his court? Some may try to sucker up to you, but what about the others of greater ambitions? Maybe they'll want to put the king's daughter on the throne instead, because she's not only bloodline, but she's vapid and easy to control. Thus, they have a chance to rule the kingdom at proxy. Would some of the more righteous people in the kingdom just roll over and accept that there's a new ruler one day just because some shiny man said so? In this example, your players will be kicking off an entire civil war within the country that they'll need to deal with, and it's just a lot more complicated than having to deal with the king originally. Okay, so what about option B, the farmer example? How about we use our powers to train some lowly everyday farmers and some of the mightiest warriors the world has ever seen? We still need to supply them with weapons and armor, well, let's just say one of our other fellow players can turbo craft those things before the revolution and before the kingdom's authorities can catch wind of it. So we attack the kingdom and become king by bloody revolution. But by how much did we win? Are most of your men going to be injured from the battle? Are the people of the kingdom going to have enough food to survive? After all, you did recruit farmers. But what if you have an overwhelming victory? These warrior farmers could get very well drunk off their own power wanting to subjugate other kingdoms or villages that gave them even just a little bit of grief in the past. 
How will other nations see your example of power to elevate simple farmers into the, some of the world's mightiest warriors? This could very lead to a coalition or alliance being made between rival kingdoms all around you. Maybe some will attack you just because of a mutual aid deal they had with the previous king, and only the previous king. Okay, so all of this sounds really complicated, so let's just go with option C. You sleep with the king and make him so head over heels for you that you become a cornerstone in his life. The amount of love he possesses for your character means that life without you is essentially the same as death. Now the king is willing to do things for you without the messy business of bloody revolution or the sun transference of his crown. But now some of the nobles might be getting jealous of you for gaining favor of the king so quickly. What if the king decides to do something on his own that will make you happy, like outlawing all those pesky immaculate shrines in the town? After all, he's probably seen you debating with him quite a bit. Well, shit! Looks like some of the bigger head honchos in the realm are coming over to investigate, and they smell that something's off in the area, they might expand their investigation. If those realm investigators find out you're anathema, literally the worst thing to exist in their religion, they can call down a wild hunt on you and your proxy kingdom's ass. A literal holy war to purge you from their lands. And if one of those nobles who knows rumors of you being anathema slips, or maybe they just make the rumor and spread it onto you for the hell of it just to try to get rid of you? Well, shit. All of these are examples of how choices in your game world can have consequences. This is good because it helps keep a story flowing more organically. By solving one problem, you might make several other problems. Now trying to balance between the points of let's keep going and see what happens versus enough is enough is an art form of itself. There's no hard and fast rule here. You're going to have to learn by experience. Players will become frustrated if everything they ever do leads to more issues. Some will want a sense of closure on some issues. Think of this like a family tree of sorts, with a starting issue on top. Each issue is branching down into several more problems and so on. Once you feel like one point is enough, you may just want to stiff it shut and call it closed. If your players beat the everything ending terror below the surface of the kingdom, let them be celebrated throughout the region. Don't do something like make the greater everything ending terror related to the first at the beginning of the next story. Put a fork in it, it's done. Maybe instead you could get requests from other kingdoms around the globe, hearing about your monster slaying prowess and how they could be asking for your help to deal with other issues in the area. Now I don't mean that every choice a player makes should be negative. Some consequences to actions are going to be what many people at the table consider to be a large net positive, and there's nothing wrong with that. Maybe when training your soldiers, you temper their impending values with philosophical lessons on when using violence as the correct course of action. Well, in that case, worrying about your farmers wanting to take over rival kingdoms is effectively squashed. Well, what if the king who loves you dies a natural death and names you the heir to the kingdom? Well, the people in the kingdom loved you, then congratulations on your new kingdom. Again, this is mostly a preview on how to make a good story, but considering this is one of the biggest issues I hear about Exalted from new Game Masters, I figured it would be best to explain in the first video of the series. And there we go! Those are some important points I feel is necessary for starting a game of Exalted 3rd Edition. If you have any comments or questions about my performance, go ahead and mention in the comments below where I fucked up. Well, that's all I gotta say guys, take care, see you next time. Thanks for listening.